Hello, and I want to go through some issues which affect management at companies, what you might call operational issues. So operational stuff is all about things which are ongoing every single day as a business is working normally. And of course, people who are in charge of organizations have a lot to think about, a lot of things to consider. A major, major one will be security and looking after information. For many companies and organizations, information is their most valuable asset the most valuable thing they have because a lot of businesses work based on information they are holding and processing. And of course, there is this responsibility to secure personal data, which is stored about their employees and users and whatever they're storing it about. Now, this is both ethical, I think many people would argue, but also legal. According to the Data Protection Act, organizations which are storing personal information must keep it secure. I'm going to go through loads and loads of different security topics in the next few videos. But for now, let's think about what the effect of a breach of security, a cyber attack, could lead to. Well, fines. The government are able to fine you as an organisation, and these fines can be in the millions for big companies. So the office which will do the fining, it's not the police, it will be an agency called ICO which stands for the Information Commissioner's Office, and they'll give you fines if they feel like you haven't really looked after personal data. Lawsuits, people who might have data leaked, for example, might sue you. If a user feels like your security wasn't good enough, they will, may well sue you, and again, that could cost a lot of money. But what could cost even more money is your reputation loss. So if there are news stories about what's happened and people get upset, uh, that's going to massively affect how future customers feel about you. You might lose a lot of business because of it. And when you've had the cyber attack, you've got to pay a lot of money to get things fixed and get things recovered, and that may well lose you revenue. And cyber attacks are happening all the time, right? It's a really, really common thing. This one was just one I found today affecting a council in the UK. Not the most glamorous target, but it's been 11 days and they're still crippled by the cyber attack. Things don't get fixed straight away when information is, is lost and breached. It can really, really affect the company. And so it's the job of people in charge to make sure things are secured, to follow the law, but also to avoid all the negative stuff which could happen if there are attacks. But as much as you'd like to avoid these, cyber attacks and other major negative events do happen despite your best intentions. So disaster planning and recovery is you ahead of time thinking about what would happen when things go wrong. So disasters, sounds dramatic, but something like a flood or a fire or a cyber attack would be a disaster for many companies. So disaster planning in particular is like I say, think about what to do ahead of time. If you've got a plan in place, when this nightmare happens, you're not having to scramble, you're able to get your plan out and just follow the steps you've thought about ahead of time. So for example, many companies will focus on having backups ready. So if you've got a backup data center on standby, which you can switch to, that will avoid downtime if there is a fire or a flood or you get hacked. Now, having a backup room full of servers might be a bit much for lots of companies, but having backup devices or backup systems is expensive, but you might feel it's worth having in case a disaster happens. But also, once you've got stuff hopefully resolved, you're going to want to recover your data. And recovery is getting back to normal afterwards. Now, hopefully you've got a backup of your data. That's probably the most important thing. And so you'll be thinking about how you can get your systems back online, maybe recovering the data from your backup. But before you even do that, you might have to think about actually the steps involved to make sure things are safe before the data recovery begins. If you've got, say, ransomware, on your computers, well just resetting and recovering might be a waste of time unless you're certain the ransomware has been deleted. So there'll be a few steps involved to make sure things are safe and ready for recovery to begin. But also if you are say recovering from a backup, you've got to in many cases prioritize what is most important, what can you delay recovering, what is essential to your business. And planning this ahead of time avoids delays, avoids inefficiencies when things are already quite stressful and difficult. Now to move on to policies. 
And actually, disaster recovery policies are usually quite important. So the stuff I mentioned so far would be packaged into a policy usually. A policy is a document to setting out expectations for employees. So the senior staff will write policies saying what they want employees to do. And often, employees will have to sign to agree about the policy and show they've read it. So often on your first day, on the first few days of working at a company, you've got to read through all the policies, or at least say you have, and sign and say you've read it and agree. Now, this could be helpful for the employee because it could give useful information, but also is a little bit of kind of sneaky stuff going on because if you then down the line, don't follow the policy, don't adhere to it, which means not, not following it, there can be disciplinary action, which is where the company might have a formal meeting, might give you a warning, and eventually might terminate you if you're not following the policy and have done something quite badly wrong. So one policy which is important you know about are acceptable use policies. So an acceptable use policy, you might well have signed one for your school or college. They set rules for how an organization's computer systems should be used. So I'll say things like what websites you are allowed to go on, what would happen if you broke this policy, usually saying things like you can't go on gambling websites or um, inappropriate websites or gaming websites, those sort of things which might not be professional um, and could have viruses on, for example. So often this is used, or if it's used effectively, it will be used to ensure employees understand how to stay safe online. If an employee is not being safe online, they might be clicking phishing emails and downloading viruses by mistake, I assume. If you are educating them, maybe through a policy, this reduces the risk of things like cyber attacks. And finally, to mention change management, which will vary a lot depending on the business and the structure of the business. This is all about businesses formally considering adaptations. So slightly changing what they're doing to try and get more efficient, get more effective, get more money, whatever they are aiming for. And change happens all the time and it's really important people working in businesses are not against it. You know, something like Netflix, which is a massive, massive company now, started a long time ago just sending DVDs to individual people. Very different business model to what we've got now with apps and subscriptions all online. It's a very different model, although based on the same product, which is movies and films. So we've had to adapt quite a lot in the last 20 years, but it's been really, really successful. And the scale of change can vary. It can be a very small tweak. It could be a major, major restructure. And so to get through this process, often you'll have senior managers meeting to discuss. You might have meetings with your board. The board are usually people who are external, but will meet to discuss the business and try and support it. You might have shareholders, you might get involved, and there may well be market research done to see if this change will be effective, will it be popular, will it be unpopular, what do your employees think, what do your customers think, um, to try and make this change as smooth as possible. Just on the sort of reasons why change might occur, what you might hear described as the drivers of change, things which are causing you to want to change, might be things like new legislation. Legislation is another word for laws. So laws, legislation, can affect what you're doing. We've seen in recent years a lot more about data protection, things like the cookie law, things like GDPR, the Data Protection Act, which have caused companies to, for example, on websites, give you big, big warnings about cookies, which can be quite annoying. In fact, to change how they approach websites due to this law, that's quite a big change. Also, you know, there might be new competitors, new companies joining, trying to be more aggressive. Netflix have got loads of competitors nowadays, most big, TV movie companies have got a streaming service. Netflix have got to be more aggressive, perhaps. But also changing customer attitudes. Over time, people change what they want. We've seen how in the last 15, 20 years, high streets have changed a lot because things like electronic shops closed down because things like Amazon have replaced it. Um, consumers change their preference. But more positively, I suppose, also technology will change and there'll be improvements which might give you more opportunities. We've seen how things like fiber has massively sped up networks because copper is much slower. But also, especially due to COVID, we've seen remote working becoming much more popular. So remote access, where somebody's able to work from home and 
maybe be more productive, be more happy, um, not having to be physically in the office. The final thing to cover is about health and safety and employers are responsible for the safety of their employees. That might sound really obvious, but it's, it's only according to a law, which is actually quite old now, it's from 1974, called the Health and Safety at Work Act. And IT jobs can be quite office-based. So in terms of the sort of health and safety required for just offices, which aren't don't seem for most dangerous places, well, according to the law, um, employers need to make sure employees have enough rest, rest breaks. They can't be sat in front of a computer all day. And things like the screen setup and the chair, um, you can reasonably expect these are good enough quality to be suitable for long and continued use. If you are, you know, uh, squinting at a screen all day or in a really old, uncomfortable chair, you could get injuries, not massively serious injuries, but you could get injuries and the employers would be responsible for um, giving compensation, which they don't want to do, of course. Now, for certainly more dangerous IT jobs, IT jobs are never that dangerous, thankfully, but if you're dealing with electrical equipment, of course, that has some element of danger because you could get electrocuted, there could be a fire, things like this. And so the most common thing employers will do is test the equipment really often. There is a legal requirement to get it tested, but they may try and do it more frequently if, if, if there is a risk assessment. So you might see devices with stickers on, which say when it's been tested and what it was tested for.